Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, and welcome back to uh, House Judiciary Committee. It is at 1.18 in the afternoon, and uh, we are going to get a walkthrough on S-140, which is an act relating to prohibiting civil arrests at courthouses. And um, we will walk through today, and we'll have the witnesses tomorrow. Uh, so with that, I will welcome our Legislative Council, Eric Fitzpatrick. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, this is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to walk the committee through Senate Bill number 140, which is an act relating to prohibiting civil arrests at courthouses. This is one of those bills where a little bit of background is very helpful before we dive into the language of the bill because to order to understand the context in which in which the the language operates, it's really helpful in this case actually. Uh, to have a little bit of historical background, uh, because what's what's going on in this bill is that it is proposing to codify a privilege that has been in existence for hundreds of years in the common law, started in the common law in England. And when we say common law, we mean, as, as the committee knows, law that has developed in the courts over the years. It's not, not by statute, but uh, has developed uh, through court decisions over the years, which are sometimes codified in statute, and that is what the proposal is to do here. Uh, and what has been the case for, for, as I say, quite a number of centuries since uh, English common law, is that there has been this prohibition on civil arrests at courthouses. And what that means is, when, when we say civil arrests, that means an arrest for purposes, and it's actually in the language of the bill, if you look at the second page, uh, further down in the bill, the term is defined, and it's defined as an arrest for purposes of obtaining a person's presence or attendance at a civil proceeding, including an immigration proceeding. So in other words, a civil arrest has nothing to do with the criminal law. It's got nothing to do with uh, an arrest warrant that's issued uh, for, for the commission of a crime. It's got nothing to do with a person being arrested by a police officer because there's probable cause to believe the person committed a crime. It's got... Um, Absolutely, the, the ability of law enforcement or anybody else to, to co, uh, conduct a criminal arrest is completely unaffected by this bill. It, it only refers to uh, the prohibition on civil arrests. And that means that you're arresting a person in order to uh, obtain their presence at a civil, not a criminal, a civil court proceeding. Now, an obvious question that might come up is, well, does that ever happen? You know, that's a legitimate question <laughs> because it doesn't happen much. It used to happen quite frequently. Um, in the past, historically, the primary way that a person's presence was obtained either as a witness or a party at a court proceeding, if they didn't come voluntarily, was to, was to arrest them. So there was a civil arrest of a person in order to bring them into court as a witness or a party in a civil proceeding. Now that's not done anymore because as, as the committee knows nowadays, uh, the modern practice and certainly for quite some time now is that uh, the sheriff serves a summons on somebody when they're when, either when they uh, are needed as a witness at a proceeding or whether they're being sued and their presence is commanded at a proceeding that's done through service of process. Sheriff brings them uh, notice and a complaint and a summons and, and serves it to them and, and they sign it. And that's how a person's presence is obtained at a civil proceeding as opposed to a criminal one. But uh, for a long time, that wasn't the case. Uh, if someone didn't appear voluntarily, they could be arrested civilly and brought to court for the proceeding. So as I mentioned, uh, that practice doesn't occur anymore. <clears throat> but one of, the, one of the few instances in which the civil arrest uh, proceeding or mechanism, I should say, still happens, is in immigration proceedings, federal immigration proceedings. Uh, when uh, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, for example, federal immigration agency, arrests a person to bring them to an immigration proceeding, that is an a civil arrest because the immigration proceedings are civil in nature. They're not criminal. So they uh, uh, are sometimes, as uh, people have you know, potentially heard, it has been reported in the news that these arrests have taken place to secure uh, someone's presence for either deportation or immigration proceedings of another nature uh, in federal, uh, arrested by a federal officer and brought before a federal tribunal. 
for that sort of proceeding. So that's sort of the background of what um, what is going on in S140, because the, propo the proposal here is to prohibit those kinds of arrests, that a person can't be uh, arrested for purposes of their appearance in the civil proceeding. Um, I know everybody's got a copy of the bill, uh, so I don't think I'll ask the chair. <laughs> you probably don't need a screen share for the bill, I assume. Um, Correct. There is one, I want to do a quick screen share if that's okay, because there's a recent, a very recent um, federal court case from the Southern District of New York in which this federal privilege that I'm talking about, sorry, not federal privilege, this privilege against um, civil arrest was discussed and I highlighted a couple of pieces from it that might be interesting for, for the committee to understand. So if that works okay, I could just share that for a moment. Sure, sure. Thank you. I'll just do, shouldn't take, oops. Um, great. Now, as I say, this uh, court decision was recent. I believe it's December of 2019. And it came up precisely because of uh, an arrest for purposes of an immigration proceeding, a federal immigration proceeding, as I just mentioned. And it happened in the state of New York. Oops, sorry. There. Why is that not working? Um, here we go. Can everyone see this highlighted language? No, not yet. Uh, is Eric a co-host? Mm -hmm. yep. there, uh, there, there we go. There we go. Is that okay now? Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So yes, so this is from December 2019 uh, in the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York, a uh, case called Gonzalez for the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And um, the judge discussed this privilege against civil arrest at courthouses uh, in extensive detail. And I have a copy of the full case if anyone wants to take a look at it. It's actually interesting. But I just highlighted a couple of pieces that I thought would be interesting um, for the committee to understand before we uh, walk through the language of the bill. You see the court discussed the history of the privilege and that it, it uh, dated to English common law. And it was a privilege against any civil arrest in and around courthouses and also against civil arrest of witnesses and parties necessarily traveling to and from the courthouse. Uh, some language that, that the court quotes from Blackstone's Commentaries, which is an ancient and famous treatise on the law, sort of states the privilege quite clearly, suitors, <clears throat> witnesses, and other persons necessarily attending any courts of record upon business are not to be arrested during their actual attendance, attendance which includes their necessary coming and going. Um, the coming and going piece, uh, you'll see actually it's not highlighted, but it says in the middle of the paragraph there that it, uh, um, it dates to at least the 15th century. So it uh, has quite, quite a bit of history behind it. There's a case from 1791 here that's quoted in the bottom of this page and the top of the next one, which just has, I like the phrase that the, that the uh, privilege applies. This is the top, the first line of the next page. Privilege from arrest, euendo, eridayuendo. My pronunciation of that Latin is probably way off, but it means going and returning. <laughs> that was interesting. So applies going and returning to the courthouse. Um, you see the purpose of it, was to encourage parties and witnesses to come forward voluntarily, which makes sense. Uh, you know, the idea is that if, uh, witnesses and parties are afraid that they're going to be arrested when they show up at courthouse, then they're less likely to appear voluntarily. And also to maintain order in the courthouse um, so that there isn't the, um, the tumult, as the case refers to, that would occur if their arrests are occurring at the courthouse. So as I mentioned, the privilege was adopted into American common law after independence, so it's part of American common law, and it's never thought to apply to criminal arrests. It's civil only. So this privilege uh, does exist, uh, but the question that the court had to decide in, uh, in the um, New York case is, well, does that privilege apply when someone is uh, arrested by federal authorities for purposes of uh, an immigration proceeding. So the uh, court said it did, 
privilege does apply. So a person could, could not be arrested for that. Uh, but that applies only in New York. Now it's actually only in the Southern District of New York, uh, since it's uh, one federal court case in one district of uh, the federal court system. So the proposal in S-140 is to make that privilege to make clear, to codify this common law privilege, make it a part of Vermont statute so that it would apply to arrests at Vermont courthouses uh, under the statute, if it were to pass. Should mention that two other states have passed similar legislation in which I certainly looked at those when I was drafting this language and they are after the court decision actually, New York passed a statute. So subsequent to that decision from the Southern District, New York does now have a statute that codifies the common law privilege and Colorado as well. So there are two states that, that at least that I'm aware of that have similar statutes in place now. So having said that, um, that's sort of the background and the, and the big picture of how <clears throat> the privilege works and what the, the general purpose of S-140 is. You'll see when you look at the language that, uh, that it specifically does what I just described in general terms. And the, the first subsection, subsection A, proposes to add this new section in the, uh, in the court procedure step, title, title 12. <laughs> Subsection A just lays out the prohibition quite clearly. Any person or family member or household member of the person. So it's not, it's not just the person, but it's also the person's family or household member who is attending a court proceeding in good faith as a party, juror, attorney, or witness. So it can be any one of those uh, roles that the person has for a court proceeding. And while they're attending it, they're pri they are privileged from civil arrest while they're either traveling to, entering, remaining at, or returning from the court proceeding. So that's the general prohibition. The person has this privilege uh, not to be arrested while they're uh, going to or returning from or at a court proceeding. Now, there are some exceptions in subsection B, you see. Uh, Excuse me, Eric. Yeah, Eric, sorry. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Please go ahead. Um, just trying to understand, so juror, attorney, witness, those roles are clear to me. Party, do we mean sort of like a, a part, someone that has like legal party status in the proceedings? Yes, yes, so, it's a, absolutely. Like someone who was just there, if I was just there to support a family member who was a defendant or a plaintiff, in a case, my reading is I would not be covered by this language because I'm not there as kind of a form in one of the a formal role in with regards to the case itself. I'm just kind of there as a familial support person <coughs> and not a household member. Yes, if you if, if you were not a maybe I was a household member, but but I wasn't attending in one of these specific roles. You know what I mean? Like if I went in my spouse was a defendant and I was just kind of sitting there in the courtroom to be a support person for them I wouldn't be covered under this law if I was uh if I was called as a witness in the proceedings I would be am I reading that correctly yes I think you've got it yep exactly thank you yeah sure uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this happened right here in our in at our court, the Windsor uh, courthouse. Um, a family member drove another family member uh, to our courthouse and basically was detained. Um, uh, by ICE because they heard that he would be driving uh, his spouse for a um, ticket hearing. So uh, is that person just out of luck at that point in the courthouse? If the person was not gonna be a witness, you mean? If he, right. Uh, then I think the way the language is written, that yeah, if the person was not going to be either a party, witness, juror, etc., they would be covered as a family member, but they would also have to fit one of those categories. 
So in addition, so so, so it, it, it um, unless you met one of those categories, basically, you're you're kind of out of luck. Is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think uh, that's right. If you don't fit into a category, then then the privilege doesn't apply. I think that's okay. I think that's the, the right reading of it. Okay, no, it, it, I'm not sure where i'm at with, as far as amending uh but it just you know that's basically what happened here and even if this was in existence it wouldn't have helped this family uh from the detention component huh. okay thank you uh tom yeah so Eric, what would happen to use a scenario coach just used, but and uh, say the person driving the other person in is in one of these categories. Um, it's a federal agency that is there to make the arrest or whatever. Um, are they go, do they go by federal law or state law? Well, that's, that's a, a very um, good question. And uh, it was actually, uh, you probably um, mean to also ask, what about the supremacy clause, <laughs> right? The, uh, right. The, the what yeah. you said? The supremacy <laughs> clause of the United States Constitution. I think that's, right. that's what you're getting at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's a legitimate question. And uh, in fact, it was addressed in the, in the uh, federal court decision that I was referring to earlier. The one uh, in New York? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And what the court held in that case was that, yes, generally speaking, federal law is supreme under the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution uh, to the extent that uh, federal law either expressly overrules state law or whether it by implication overrules state law. But what the court held in that case was that federal immigration law also was subject to the privilege, to this common law privilege, predated federal immigration law, as I was mentioning, goes back many centuries. And the court said, yeah, um, federal immigration law, uh, by implication, adopted this privilege is when the United States adopted the common law at independence, and, and therefore the privilege still applies. So uh, it's, still, it's still prohibited. <laughs> Now, that's, that was one, <clears throat> to be frank, that was uh, the Southern District of New York's conclusion. You would, I think, have to anticipate that the, a statute like this, you know, until either the Second Circuit, which Vermont is in, or the United States Supreme Court reaches the same conclusion, it's possible that question would be litigated. But there's, uh, there's uh, uh, grounds for concluding that, that uh, the privilege could override federal law because of uh, for the rash for the reason that the the judge indicated in the New York case. Okay, great, if we, Eric. If you could send along the um, the case to, for Amber to post, that'd be great. Yeah, at, sure. At some point, yeah. Afterwards. I actually actually it might have been confusing in my email. It actually was in my previous email, but because they both had the same title, my excerpt and the full case itself. So. I'll, re I'll resend it if you can't find it, Amber. Thanks. Oh, no, I know it. That was my fault. I should have titled it differently. Uh, Bob has a question. Uh, I was going to wait to get on your walk through, Eric. I don't know if you've done it or not. But basically, uh, I got two questions, actually. So we are creating a Vermont law to direct federal law enforcement as to what they can and can't do. Because you'd have to give me an example where Vermont law enforcement would arrest anybody on a civil warrant heading to a civil court. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know of any other examples that, that when this would occur. So I think you're right that uh, at least the, the most um, sort of well-known example is exactly that, is, is arrest by uh, federal immigration authorities, exactly. Because I've, I've brought people to civil court once or twice in my life. Right. <clears throat> If it's a civil arrest warrant, they're never going to go to jail. They're going to go to civil court. So I can't think of any other reason why if someone's going to civil court, Vermont law enforcement would arrest someone to continue their journey to civil court. And the example that you gave was 
There's also an exception that says that uh, Vermont law enforcement officers could be held liable if, in fact, assisting a law enforcement, a federal law enforcement agency from uh, executing an arrest. That's right. Yes, that's part of the. Oh, bill. if I yeah. drive down the road and in the perfect world, and one of those law enforcement officers is, is getting assaulted, <coughs> I can't stop and assist that person? Well, actually, no, that's a, a good point because that discussion came up in the Senate as well, as they wanted to be sure that the if, if a state law enforcement officer is assisting a federal law enforcement officer for purposes of uh, this arrest in which they could be liable, they didn't want it to be a, a situation where they were, for example, coming to the defense of the federal law enforcement officer or they were unknowingly participating in an arrest for, for immigration purposes. So the language was inserted, you'll see, uh, uh, this is in remedies, subsection C1, person who violates the section by knowingly and willfully executing or assist assisting with the arrest. So you have to knowingly uh, and intentionally uh, be arresting someone for purposes of the civil proceeding in order for you to be liable. And one, one quick follow-up, if I might. Uh, yeah. So if, if, if this passes and federal law enforcement can't execute for whatever reason because of we're codifying something, if in fact they are doing that and local law enforcement drives by and they are being resisted or assaulted or whatever, just going back to the fruit of the poisonous tree, they had no legitimate reason to being there to begin with. So if we stop and assist, does that also throw us into the, the fruit of the poisonous tree? Uh, again, I think it goes back to whether the the uh, awesome. whether there's a knowing and intentional assisting with an arrest, uh, knowing that it's for immigration or some other civil purpose. So if, if they're assisting an arrest for purposes intentionally, knowing that it was uh, uh, in order to obtain the person's presence at a civil proceeding as opposed to a criminal proceeding, um, then that's where the prohibition applies. And that's where, in other words, if, it's, if the person doesn't know that, the state law enforcement officers say it's just protecting the, per the federal officer because they're involved in a scuffle or, uh, or because they just simply don't know that they're, they're assisting in an arrest that's uh, for a a civil proceeding, whether an immigration proceeding or some other kind, if they're not aware of it, uh, then I don't think they would be uh, prohibited from helping. So the bottom line here is we're creating a, a, a section of law to address federal law enforcement. <laughs> yeah, at least, uh, yep, certainly that's that's uh, a big part of it, I think, yep. Okay. It doesn't only apply to them, but I think you're right that at least that's the most uh, sort of well-known example of when a civil arrest does occur. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it, 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 I don't know if, you, if you've already walked through this part. Um, <clears throat> on a subsection C, <laughs> C1, this is probably, this may be nitpicky, I don't know, but, uh, is a civil contempt proceeding really an appropriate remedy in this situation? Isn't civil contempt to force somebody to do something, essentially? Uh, I just don't understand how a civil contempt proceeding works in this kind of scenario. Uh, I guess I'm not quite following the question. Well, if, if somebody violates the section, by assisting with the rest. Right. My understanding of a civil, well, my understanding, just tell me if I'm misunderstanding this part, a civil contempt proceeding is essentially to get somebody to do something, that they're, they're in contempt because they are uh, not producing evidence or they are, uh, it, it's, it's not like a punishment. It, it is a, a, some way to coerce essentially uh, the individual subject to the contempt to clear themselves of the contempt. Like, how does one clear themselves of the contempt in this kind of situation that the action that has occurred is, it has already passed? I think that 
that uh, I can look into this a bit more, but I thought civil contempt was broader than that. And that, for example, someone who's disrupting the court and disobeying a court order, for example, could be held in contempt, even though the action has already passed and that that's used as a as a consequence for their behavior in court. And I think that was sort of the thought here is that is that uh, it's because it's connected to uh, court proceedings uh, that it would be an appropriate remedy. OK. All right. Yeah, maybe I have a too narrow of an understanding of, of civil versus criminal contempt. But we can it's a worth it's worth looking into. I'm not 100 percent sure. May I see check into where some other circumstances where civil contempt are, is used. <coughs> So as uh, Representatives Lulon and Norris were getting at, that's the, those are the first provision of what the remedies are if the statute is violated. And that's that, and this, that is specifically um, targeted at the person who violates. So in other words, if you're a law enforcement officer or someone else who violates this section by knowing, knowingly and willfully executing or assisting with a civil arrest, um, then you can be uh, subject to civil contempt proceedings, or you could be liable in a civil action for false imprisonment. So that's what can the penalties that are available for a person who violates. Now, if you go on in the remedies provision, you'll see that there's also civil remedies provided for the person who is arrested. So if the person who is arrested in violation, in other words, there's a civil arrest contrary to the statute, um, they can bring a civil action uh, in civil court in the civil division for damages. That could include injunctive relief, equitable relief, punitive damages, costs, and attorney's fees. So they have this ability to bring a civil lawsuit uh, if they've been arrested in violation of the statute. And you'll see the Office of the Attorney General also has uh, some authority to bring a civil action, in this case, uh, for injunctive or equitable relief. That means, for example, an action to uh, seek the court to declare that a certain practice is unlawful or to order that a certain practice uh, not occur anymore. And the, so the AG's office is given specific authority to bring those sorts of actions. There's some immunity in subsection subdivision four. You'll see that uh, the judiciary has immunity so that it can't be subject to any suits for any, any actions they take to maintain order or safety in the courtroom. And uh, civ the civil arrest definition I already went over. Uh, and the household member definition is the same as in uh, the family law, actually relief from abuse orders uh, provision defines family members because it's family members, sorry, household members who are uh, have the ability to bring RFA actions, uh, to seek RFAs, I should say. And that definition is just, uh, is the same one that's used here. So that's the, essentially um, what the bill does and what the language does. <coughs> Thank you, Eric. Um, I know that um, civil con contempt can be used in um, in family court. Uh, you know, for instance, failure to pay child support or you know, so fa yeah, failure to follow a court order, basically. Yeah, I think, but the idea is that <clears throat> you can, under civil contempt, I'm looking at the rule here, uh, uh, and it comports with what I thought I understood, is, is you have to have the ability to purge the contempt. You can be fined. Uh, or until you pay that child support is one situation. The situation where there's misbehavior in court, you can be held in contempt and you can be fined until you cease that behavior. You know, when you cease that behavior, then, then you could purge your contempt. But in this situation, it's like an individual, just an arrest, a, a, a one-time kind of situation. It's not like an ongoing behavior, I don't think. I mean, it's not like they're going to be <coughs> arresting people continuously. It's a very rare event. So that's why it just doesn't seem to fit to me. But I'll defer to Eric on that. But. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, Eric, if you could get back to us on, on that, that'd be great. Sure. And we, we also, so we are going to um, hear tomorrow from um, mm -hmm. From our witnesses, and yeah, so we can, and you know, we could ask those questions as, as well. Any, okay, anything else, or uh, Madam Speaker? 
I mean, uh, yeah, I, yes. just, I, I just promoted you. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> little, little Freudian slip there. Uh, there was an article in our local paper today uh, because we're, we're kind of uniquely poised on the border of New Hampshire, uh, Hartford is. So the Upper Valley, you know, is more like 60,000 people, you know, in one space. You know, there, it, the border really doesn't exist. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, this is in relation to some of the testimony we took today, uh, you know, regarding Article 11 and a comment made, uh, I think, and shared by us all, you know, the quality of the hire is critical. So the question becomes, you know, what's gotten us here? And it is that question of trust. So there's an article in the Valley News. Uh, I'd love to share it with you, and then you can tell me if you'd like us to, you know, to share it with the rest of the uh, committee. But it speaks yeah. about what's going on um, uh, in New Hampshire right now. And because we share that border, I know that a number of our officers have left Vermont to go to New Hampshire for employ. And every once in a while, we get some that come in that direction. But it's usually uh, an exit migration because they pay more. Uh, so, uh, which, you know, you got to take care of your family, too. Uh, but it's more the trust part of the article that I think you might find interesting. But I'll, I'll, I'll send that your way. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any um, questions for Eric on the language of this bill? And again, we'll hear our testimony tomorrow. Nope. Great. Well, thank you, Eric. Yeah, sure. Appreciate it. And thanks, um, Eric. Yeah, yeah you bet. Great. Thanks for coming in. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> if you have any other questions? Let me know. Okay. Thanks. Great. So we have a brief break. Uh, we're going to start back up at two o'clock. Okay.